Shogun episode three really ramps up on the action. It's weird because this was probably the easiest episode to watch and the most fun, but there was also a couple of scenes in here that were kind of meh and felt a little bit forced. So it might actually be my least favorite, even though it was the most exciting, which is kind of odd. But a lot happens in this one. The alliances are fully formed. We do start to see the beginning of the romance arc. It seems pretty obvious at this point. And it looks like we're going to be heading more for a war type arc coming up. These are kind of the first skirmishes that we see here. So let's just get into it. Right away, Toronaga is talking to Yubishige about how he betrayed him and what Ishido offered him. He says he offered him his seat on the council as a regent. And Toronaga says, is this what you wanted? And Yubishige says, no. And he says, well, what do you want? And he says, to expand my fief with the province of Suruga. Toronaga decides to trust him. And part of why Toronaga decides to trust him is because the assassins came for John, not him. Obviously, if they had been for him, it would have meant that they were sent by Ishido or Yubishige. But because they were sent for John, it was coming from the Christian sect or the Christian regions. And Toronaga says, essentially, if you can get us out to safety in your fishing village, including the Anjin, you can have it. So he decides to trust him. We find out that he was betraying Toronaga, but not really by choice, because his explanation is essentially that if he hadn't done it, Ishido was going to kill Toronaga and him anyway. So the only way for him to get that province was to stay alive, which was to betray Toronaga. It wasn't out of his own ambition, which kind of touches on the point that I made last video in episode two, where I was saying he kind of misleads Ishido about the personality of the barbarian or John. He's kind of telling him half truths and stuff. He's kind of non-committal because he's trying to stay alive. So pretty much what he's doing is trying to side with the winner. You could say it makes him cowardly. You could say it makes him smart, practical, whatever. That's all pretty open to interpretation, I think. And seemingly, it was the most practical decision. Without John showing up, Toronaga was pretty much screwed. So it seems like he was just making kind of a cold, calculated decision for survival. Still a psycho, though. This one's called Chapter 3, Tomorrow is Tomorrow. The implication seemingly being just worry about today, make sure you get through today, and deal with tomorrow's problems tomorrow when you get there. Because they're kind of in a fight for survival this episode. We go to the captain of the black ship and the father that we've been dealing with and the other high up religious figures for the Portuguese. And the father is explaining that Tornaga found out about their dealings and their profits and that he wants to renegotiate essentially. And the captain's frustrated and he's like, I don't work for the church, I work for the king. And this ship is leaving tonight. I have a million ducats sitting on that ship that I'm not going to lose to the sea or the wind. So he says he's leaving tonight no matter what. As the captain's leaving, the Portuguese pilot, Rodriguez, says, you know, if you leave without permission, we can never come back. And the captain pretty much says, they're screwed now. The longer this British guy's here, it's only going to get worse. We're leaving now, not sticking around to wait. We go to John and Mariko, and Toronaga and Yubishibe actually talked about this too, about the assassin is from this Buddhist monk sect. And Mariko says she worked in the palace as a maid for years. Some people spend their entire lives waiting for a single kill. So it's this special sect of assassins that makes some kind of Buddhist oath. And John tells her that she's in denial. The Portuguese are after him. He needs to accept it. And he's getting worked on here for stitches because he stepped in front of Toronaga and got cut. And the doctor's working on him. He's like, he's too tense. He doesn't need a doctor. He needs a woman. Mariko asks if she should send somebody. And he's like, no. And she's like, would you like a boy perhaps? <laughs> and he makes a face like, what the hell is wrong with the people in this part of the world? <laughs> so he declines. Mariko's husband comes in. And he's like, we're going with Toronaga. We're all leaving. Let's go. And then we get a little bit more of him being pretty short with her. Obviously to emphasize that their relationship isn't a super happy one. So that people will root for the romance arc between John and Mariko. Pretty clear what it's setting up, I think. We go to the woman whose husband committed seppuku and had to kill their kid. And she's looking at their remains in boxes. And Toronaga's right-hand guy gave them to her. And he says, we're going to Ajiro tonight. He wants you to go. And then he's talking about the samurai swords of her dad. And I can't tell what her deal is. Because she gets quite a bit of screen time this episode. So I'm assuming she's going to have some kind of bigger part. But it's really hard to tell what it is at this point. Because we've literally seen nothing from her. Except the stuff with her kid and husband dying. So I'm kind of wondering if maybe she'll be the one to kill Ishido in the end. Or if she'll get like, her own little assassin revenge type thing. I have no clue. But they definitely focus on her more than they would for just some random character. And he just talks a little bit about how her husband and kid died for a bigger fight. And now it's her turn. Which is kind of part of what makes me think that she might have some kind of involvement in revenge against Ishido. Since he was the one that her husband disrespected to get himself and their kid killed. You can see Yubishige and his men are all armored up. 
he said there's a bunch of people that want the engine dead. And I think their costumes look pretty cool. Is mean, is the main reason that I pause in this scene. I'm assuming it's historically accurate, but I have no clue. I've seen it being praised online for it, for whatever that's worth. Ishido shows up before they can leave. And he's like, I want to check who's in the litters because Toronaga is known for being tricky. He wants to come verify that the people that are supposed to be leaving are leaving. And Toronaga's kid is trying to pick a fight with Ishido and his men. And he's getting pretty antagonistic, which seems like kind of foreshadowing for the future. Because he's been sort of edging this whole time on losing it and kind of wanting to fight and be violent. So it seems like that's where he's headed. Kind of the typical stupid kid who's brash trope. And his right hand man comes in and is like, oh, it's, I'm misunderstanding, I'm sure. No big deal. They have the litters. We see the girl whose husband and kid died and Toronaga's wife. So John is right next to the litter. One of Toronaga's maids fakes like she's pregnant and falling down and kind of causes a scene. And we see his wife sneak off and Toronaga sneaks into the litter now that it's already been checked. But Ishido insisted that his men escort them outside the gate because it's his territory. So obviously it's still going to be a problem for them if they check again. And I like all the little chess plays here. You know, Ishido making sure that it's the right people. Toronaga anticipating it. Having a plan to switch after the litter was checked. It's good just to see little clever shit going on the whole time. And everybody's trying to make moves on one another. That actually makes sense. <laughs> one of Ishido's men. And he's like, Ishido was confused when you decided to leave with Toronaga. And Yubishige is like, look, I have to do my duty. I can't get out of that. As his excuse for going back to Toronaga as far as loyalty. So John is asking Mariko in Portuguese if she knew. And she's like, I don't think anybody did. But Toronaga is famous for his trickery. And this is when we find out that at six, he was sold off as a hostage. He got kind of traded around, it sounds like, as a ward in a bunch of different places for leverage. And he lived his whole life surrounded by enemies. So he was forced to learn to be clever, to survive. So that because of Toronaga's trickery that he's known for, which I like as a backstory, they do another check at the gate of the litters and no one's going to stop him. So John throws a tantrum to avoid a fight. So he starts saying it's rude to look into a lady's quarters and in his country, a lady's purity is everything. And it's this huge offense. And they kind of hit him and tell him to knock it off and stuff. But Mariko translates for him and it does the thing where they're, just as they're about to check and see Toronaga, someone else comes in and is like, come on, let's go. This is one of those scenes that I'm not a huge fan of. It's just done so often. It's not even that it's a bad scene. It's just done a lot. And it's kind of played out for me. But, you know, again, we see John acting quickly. And he's quick on his feet and all that. And this and this strengthens the bond between him and Toronaga and Mariko. Because he's obviously being brave. He can't even speak the language. And he's making a big scene in a place where they refer to him as barbarian. And want him dead. So they're kind of walking and talking you find out that John has a couple kids and Mariko says something about the clouds and the rain meeting and she's talking about sex. And earlier she referred to it as pillowing and John was like, no, I understand the meaning. You just keep saying it very poetically <laughs> because she's asking about if women in his part of the world are actually treated as pure in the way that he was acting. He's like Christ now. And he kind of compares it to her country where he was calling the doctor a pimp for trying to send women to his room and casual buggery and that sort of stuff. <laughs> Just a good little dialogue scene between the two of them. And again, pretty transparent, I think, where it's headed. And he was also kind of commenting on how marriage works. And he's like, I'm assuming that man was your husband. And she looks miserable, obviously. Again, laying the groundwork so that assuming their romance happens, the audience is rooting for them and not against them. Again, assuming that the romance does happen, you're rooting for them as a couple. And she's not framed as some kind of adulteress or harlot or whatever. They get ambushed with fire arrows and stuff, and it's the Christians. We see Kiyama, who's one of the Christian regents. His guy's like, hey, Ishida's married down there too. And he pretty much says, I don't care. The heretic is down there, is the long and short of it. And this is one of those scenes, I think the action is kind of meh. There's some iffy choreography. They're kind of surrounded and just managed to slip through. And this is where Toronaga gets exposed. So then Ishida's men who are escorting him also turn on him. So they're like super outnumbered here, but they manage to get away. And we see that Yubishige and Toronaga are really fucking people up. John and Mariko have a little bit of fighting that looks super awkward and kind of slow and stilted. Like their parts, I think, look pretty awkward. The stuff with everyone else looks all right. But logistically, it's also kind of hard to keep track because they all look kind of similar in their outfits. They're encircled. It's dark. And then the camera's kind of jumping all over the place. So it's an okay action scene. Not the end of the world that it's not John Wick or something. But, you know, obviously the story's good and the characters are good. So you can kind of overlook... TV action. <laughs> and 
And there's a little, nice little bit of banter in here where Yubishige is like, I wish you would tell me about these things before you do them. And Tornaga is just like, yeah, I'll keep it in mind. As a nice way of saying, like, deal with it. <laughs> so Toranaga's general that Mariko is married to says, you guys go ahead. We'll stay behind and hold them off and they catch up. Obviously laying the groundwork for what's going to happen at the end of the episode. They manage to hold them off so the important people can slip through. And then Kiyama says, go let the ones in the harbor know that the heretic is coming so that they can be ready for them also. So the black ship is about to leave the port, as we saw earlier in the episode. And there's another ship out there that's not quite as big. And John's like, let's get on these little boats and row out there. We can talk to them. Because there's a blockade, obviously, at the end of the harbor of little boats. And they explain that essentially there's no way they're going to make it through without the black ship. Because the black ship is huge and can just force its way through. They start rowing. Mariko's husband is on the pier. So she pretty much just has to watch him fight to his death. John's like, let's go back. He could still make it. Again, the cultural clash thing. Yubishige just shakes his head no. And then we see him run into the mob, and he's never killed on screen. But I really hope he's not alive. Someone in my comments mentioned this, and it's a good point. I really hope they don't do the off-screen thing where, because he was off-screen, he's not actually dead. I hate that writing style so much. As if being off-screen just suddenly solves all the problems. Because when we see him off-screen, he's surrounded by like 20 dudes, and we know that Ishido's other men are still coming. So assuming John and Mariko get together, there's no way that he should be alive later to add more unnecessary drama through lazy writing, I don't think. So they get away, and Ishida realizes that Yubishige betrayed him. John's like, would they board us if we try to just go through him? And they're like, yeah. John's like, well, then we're stuck. So he's like, but they can't sink that one, the black ship. So they're going to go talk to the captain and try to negotiate passage out of the harbor. Toronaga goes on board to negotiate. He's there with John. And he's talking to the father, who can speak Portuguese and Japanese. The captain's like, well, the price went up. It's not enough just to give us passage out of here. So he offers him 10,000 silver coins to invest in silk and keep half the profits. And then he offers the father a church in Edo, which is a pretty big deal. I'm assuming he's doing this, well, one, because he doesn't have a choice, but also because he intends to get the Catholicism out of Japan entirely. I imagine he doesn't feel the need to worry about this down the road. But that's obviously just speculation on my part. They do have a very big honor thing there, so maybe he does intend to build it and let them do their thing. And in exchange for this church, Toranaga wants him to bring the Christian regions to his side, Kiyama and Edo. And the father is discussing it with, he calls him his eminence. And he's like, that's bribery. We can't do that. But then he just does a bunch of weasel word bullshit and says, but maybe we can make a suggestion to him. So essentially they're going to do it and take the bribe. A nice little reflection of how corrupt they are despite being highly religious figures the captain demands that john stay behind and we see the father and the higher up say good job getting him to agree to that we'll hold him to his word even after he's dead so they don't give a shit about that deal they just wanted the permission to build the church and now they're going to do it so the black ship is going to take the higher ups from the japanese out of the harbor and then put them back on their own boat and john is staying on the other boat until they get out of the harbor because he has to stay behind. And this part's kind of unclear to me, because their little shitty boat was supposed to just stay in the harbor, but John goes to the captain and says, sound the drums, and they just do it. So I don't really know what the impetus is there for them to listen to him. When Toronaga agreed to hand them over and is the one in charge, it's not quite clear to me why they just listen to him and start rowing. So this all seems just kind of contrived to me. John essentially has the little Japanese boat race the black ship out of the harbor, and the Portuguese pilot is kind of laughing and joking with him. And the captain says, if he gets closer, just sink the boat. So I don't really understand the dynamics at play here. Why John is able to be in charge, why they're listening, and kind of how they get out of this. So the black ship is trying to run them onto the rocks. And the captain's like, ram them if they're not going to go on the rocks. And the Portuguese pilot, Rodriguez, is like, it'll damage the hull, captain. So the Portuguese pilot lets him slide by. And the captain's bitching at him. He's like, no, he already had the edge. I couldn't do anything about it. And Rodriguez kind of mutters to himself, we're even now. Because obviously, John went down the cliff and saved him. So now he let John escape, and they're even. Which is fine. He's honorable. They saved each other's lives once. Not the worst thing. So Toronaga says, tell the captain thanks for the use of his ship and getting us out. But seeing as the engine's already out of Osaka, our deal has been kept. Like, you're not getting him back. Kind of a sketch move there that the agreement was he would stay behind in Osaka. And since he's already outside of Osaka, they're not going to do anything. Because they took their guns and stuff, so they could just fight them or throw them off the ship. But I guess they want to keep good relations with Japan and whoever wins. So, eh. The whole last 15 minutes 
was exciting to watch, but it does feel a bit convenient. Mainly that the rowers would listen to John more than anything. When you compound that with the rowers listening to John, the Portuguese guy being honorable, and then Tornaga kind of skirting his word. When you pile on coincidences like that, sometimes it just feels a bit contrived overall, I guess. Even if each of those things individually is fine, it does feel a little bit like, eh, kind of convenient it worked out. For me, at least. Now Ashido's pissed off and the other regents are kind of bickering. Kiyama's like, yeah, there's too many bandits out here. And Ashido's like, we had an agreement to lawfully execute him. And Kiyama's like, yeah, and yet Toronaga stole him and you didn't do shit. So kind of fuck off. So now they're in fighting, which obviously is good for Toronaga. Hiromatsu shows up, who's Toronaga's right-hand man, who I can never remember his damn name. And he gives a letter of resignation to Ishida, who says this doesn't change anything. And Hiromatsu essentially says a technicality that the Taiko required five regions for any vote. So it had to be five to zero for everything they voted on. So essentially they can't impeach him four to nothing. They'll have to elect a new regent or Toronaga will have to pass it down or however it works. So Toronaga says his kid is going to a Jiro with Yabushige and he's going to Edo. And Yabushige is going to train a new regiment in using John's weapons, essentially. And we get a nice little callback here where his son's like, when are you going to trust me? And Toronaga's like, you're trying to play a game of friends and enemies and you have to only rely on yourself. Obviously referring to his whole hostage situation where he was surrounded by enemies. And he's trying to keep his son away from this violent lifestyle is what it seems like. John and Mariko were talking. Obviously he apologizes about her husband. They're talking about their own countries and how winter's coming. And he admits that he has two kids that he's never even met. So he left them behind. He specifies just under two years. He says that the sea is what beckoned him. He doesn't have any lords. Kind of he's on his own. Again, I'm assuming laying the groundwork to make it not seem like he's a piece of shit when him and Mariko get together, presumably soon. <laughs> so Toronaga thanks him for his bravery and says that the priest handed him over the books and that they say that these books will prove he's a pirate. But these books will take a long time to translate. So he's kind of deferring judgment until later. Pretty much he wants to use John as long as he can. Toronaga asks John to train his regiments with their weapons. And at first he's going to say no, and then he changes his mind and says, okay, but he wants his men back. And Toronaga grants him the title of Hatamoto because they keep calling him Barbarian. And they don't explain what it is. Everyone makes a face like they're shocked. And Mariko says it's a really big deal and a big honor. And then Toronaga wants to go for a swim and he wants John to teach him how to dive. So he just has him dive in over and over and over. And then they have a race to the shore. The episode ends. So yeah, a lot of action in this one. Couple conveniences, overall still good. Not like story breaking problems. Just things that are a bit like, eh, when you step back and think about all of them. But yeah, overall, I definitely enjoyed it. Really looking forward to the rest of the season in episode four. And I don't want to keep going too long. So if you've watched it, let me know what you think. I'll try to respond to all the comments, like and subscribe, and all that. Thanks. See ya.